I think we can get started. Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today for the seminar, we have uh, Tim Barfoot from the University of Toronto. Uh, he's an associate professor there. If you're here, you probably read his bio online. So I'll tell you something that's not in his bio, something uh -oh. about Tim. Uh, so you know, he does autonomous exploration and mapping um, as his career, but it turns out that's also one of his hobbies. So uh, Tim's into geocaching. Who's heard of geocaching? Does anyone know what that is? All right, lots of you know what geocaching is. All right, so if you ever see Tim at a conference and he's walking around in the courtyard of the conference doing this kind of thing, that's what he's doing. He's looking for, looking for geocaches. So um, if you don't know what geocaching is, check it out. It's going to be a beautiful weekend. There's, there's, there's at least a dozen geocaches within 500 meters of us right now. How many of them did you hide? Wander around and find some, find some cool stuff. So it's all about autonomous exploration. All right, thanks for the introduction. So I was really nervous when I got invited to come and give this talk because I thought, you know, this is a pretty tough crowd for robotics, so, so I hope, uh, hope there's something of interest for you guys here. I'm going to talk about long-term visual route following, and it's a topic that I've been working on uh, for quite a long time. Uh, the talk is basically broken into two halves. The first half, I'm just going to introduce this idea of a visual route following. I was inspired a lot by uh, this idea of manifold maps, so I'll kind of get you up to speed on, on what we've done in the past on visual route following. And then in the second half, I'm going to kind of show what we're working on now to try and make these types of techniques work in the long term. Uh, various ideas from dealing with lighting change to improving our controllers over time to repairing paths and, and building maps that last over long periods of time. So about 10 years ago, I was working in industry, and I was tasked with this uh, underground mining problem. And the idea was basically to automate one of these load haul dump vehicles uh, which basically picks up a load of rock from one place underground, moves it around, dumps it, and then comes back and picks up another load. And it does this over and over all day long. And it was a perfect thing for automation, right? And of course, there's no GPS underground. And I was sitting there thinking, how am I going to do this? There were all these amazing results from SLAM in the literature. And I thought, great, we'll build a map, and then we'll localize against the map. But then I found out that the computer on this mining vehicle that I had to use was this tiny little thing that, that really wasn't going to be capable of running SLAM. And I thought, oh, no. I'm in trouble, what am I going to do? And then I remembered that I saw this talk by Andrew Howard at ICRA 2004 in New Orleans, where he introduced this idea of a manifold map. And so you see a robot navigating through the world, and it's just using wheel odometry and then storing a bunch of metric information relative to the path that it's, that it's estimated with wheel odometry. And he convinced me that this actually was a good enough map to allow the robot to navigate around in the world that it had already explored. And you know, I was sitting there with this mining problem, and I remembered this Andrew Howard uh, talk, and I thought, that's it, I'll just do this. And it turns out it just worked. So we built this, we built this uh, system for navigating these 50-ton underground mine trucks through these hallways, and you can see this, this uh, little map up here in the corner. So we've previously driven through this route. We've used just wheel odometry to estimate its motion, and from the wheel odometry, constructed a small series of overlapping occupancy grid maps. And those are actually just enough when we autonomously want to repeat the route to match laser scans to, to know where we are with respect to a path, and then sort of center ourselves in the hallway and, and continue to drive. And so this is just a really simple idea. It bypassed uh, the really hard problem, which I didn't have the computational resources to deal with, the SLAM problem, and it just built something that was good enough to solve the task that I was interested in, which was driving back and forth on the same path all day long. So that was about almost 10 years ago that we worked on that. And then I left industry and I, and I came back to academia and I thought, you know, this idea could be used on other types of robots as well. Uh, and we started dealing with robots that were operating not in these sort of simple two-dimensional underground environments, but in these outdoor, unstructured, three-dimensional environments using cameras mainly. And we built up another system that I call a teach and repeat system. And it's pretty simple. Someone grabs a joystick, someone like this, pilots the vehicle through the world. Uh, so the, the robot moves, it gathers camera data, and then it estimates its motion using visual odometry and then builds up a relative map uh, relative to this path. And then we can use that relative map to essentially navigate the robot on, uh, on an autonomous repeat. So there's, a, there's something that's taking the relative map, taking the current camera view, and localizing the robot with respect to this path. 
That's being passed to a path tracking controller that looks at where the robot is relative to the path and then tries to zero those errors. And this is good enough to actually make a robot drive around outside literally in its own tracks with sort of centimeter level precision. And we can do this over many kilometers of driving. Uh, so we were able to teach routes that, that are sort of two or three, four or five kilometers through the, one of these outdoor unstructured environments and then automatically repeat that with a, a high level of, uh, of robustness. And so let me just talk a little bit about the details of how that, that works. Uh, this is just an example of one of the maps that we create and it's a little bit different than a SLAM map. It's still sort of a pose graph type map. So we have these triangles representing poses of the robot, places that it's been. And we estimate the, the relative transform between these using visual odometry, which is reasonably cheap to compute compared to, say, a full SLAM mapping solution. And then the thing that we do to, to create a map is for every feature that we tracked uh, to produce these visual odometry estimates, we actually store those features, but we store them relative to where we first saw them rather than relative to some global reference frame. So in a sense, that's why I described this as being a, a relative map, because all of these, there's no single privileged coordinate frame in which we're trying to express all of the quantities. And in fact, this type of map is really robust even to the quality of the initial path solution that you're using. As long as it's something that's sort of locally smooth, this is a good enough map representation to, to navigate your robot. And here's just an example of uh, a path that was estimated using visual odometry, the real path was sort of down here on the ground. VO thought that the robot was driving sort of a kilometer up into the air, but it just didn't matter. Locally, because we've stored all of the metric information that the robot needs to navigate relative to the path, when the robot gets to this place that's up in the air, from its perspective, all of this metric information, because it's stored relative to the path, makes sense. And it can figure out where it is relative to the path and then steer back onto the path. And the thing that we really did that made this robust right up front was that we essentially basically just ran the visual odometry pipeline, which for those that don't know, takes left and right images from a stereo camera, does some key point detection, some stereo matching, tracking key points over time by matching them to a previous image, doing some outlier rejection, and then solving for the pose change. So we do that. But in addition to that, we're matching to these local maps that we've stored relative to the path. And it's this two-tiered system by, by matching not only to our previous frame, but also to our, our relative map that we stored compared to the path that we get this robustness because we use the VO solution to propagate what we know about the world forward. We try to match to the map. If we don't match, that's okay. We'll just let that go. We'll propagate forward again with VO and try to match to the map again. And usually that'll match and, and pick up again. So we don't actually need to match to the map continuously. Uh, by propagating the VO pipeline at the same time, that works really well. And so the, the localizer, the path localizer, looks something like this. Uh, when you want to know where the robot is with respect to the path, you kind of form a, a local submap that takes all of the information sort of nearby where the robot last localized to the path. And then it solves for this pose relative to some reference pose in this chain, which might be this one. And that gives us a path error. We then propagate forward with VO. So we can use VO to propagate that, that solve pose forward and, and then try to do this again. So we localize where that pose is with respect to the path. And we just keep doing that and pushing the token along the path. And this is enough to basically understand where the robot is relative to the path. And that's all we need for control in this problem. And so when you put all that together, here's just an example uh, from a couple of years ago of a robot that's already been driven through an environment and taught one of these paths. It's stored this relative visual map. And now it's autonomously repeating that path. And you can see that, in fact, it, it's sort of driving underground. Of course, GPS would not work here. But it's accurate enough to, to literally drive almost exactly in the tracks that, that we taught it uh, initially. Uh, we're able to handle things like direction switches. You'll notice right here, the robot's actually driving backwards. But the camera that we're using to navigate is this stereo camera, which is looking in the other direction. So it's actually doing a blind drive backwards. But it's accurate enough that if we've taught it a, an obstacle-free path initially, that we can trust it to, to stay in the tracks. You can see it thread uh, through this, this gap between obstacles. And even here on the side slope, it starts to do quite a bit of side slope uh, slip. And in fact, we're almost driving at the, the limit of this chassis of what it's capable of doing. And yet, this is fully autonomous. 
Uh, you can see it's sliding down the hill, and yet, just looking at the tracks on the ground, you can basically understand that it's doing the same thing that, that it did uh, when we taught it that route. Here's just another, uh, another example from uh, a bigger robot uh, on, on uh, the Canadian Space Agency's Mars Yard where we're repeating a route. And this is a little bit sped up, but you can see it's staying in the tracks. And I really like this test day because people often ask this question, what about using vision on Mars? What happens if dust blows up and all of this? So it turns out we were testing when uh, Hurricane Sandy blew through and a whole bunch of dust blew up and, and kind of looked like it would be obscuring the camera. But in fact, uh, because we're propagating these two solutions, the VO solution and the map matching in parallel, uh, even when the dust blew by and it didn't match well to the map, the VO carried the day and it, it kept moving. So those are sort of single repeat paths, and, and we did this stuff about uh, five years ago now. Uh, some of the other things that we've done, uh, actually Al, Al Kelly was the examiner for my PhD student that, that did this work uh, a couple of years ago now. We went beyond just trying to repeat single paths, so being able to have a human teach the path is, a, is kind of a neat idea for some applications, but not for all. So uh, what you're looking at here is sort of an autonomous goal-seeking problem in cluttered terrain where the robot doesn't know anything about this environment. And it starts driving towards the goal, uh, just using a simple uh, RRT, -type, RRT style planner. And when it encounters an obstacle, uh, it basically decides that path is no longer any good and it tries to, well, it has to make a decision about what to do next. And what we've done is we've actually coupled this with this root refollowing technique. So when the robot gets into a cul-de-sac where it can't repeat any further, it, it has already taught itself a route on the outbound pass and it uses that to backtrack. And so what you're seeing here is every time you see a blue path, that's a path that the robot has already driven forwards and now it uses that backtracking technique to, to come backwards. And then it chooses to branch off at some other point. You can actually think of this as like a physical embodiment of an RRT planner where the world is actually the model. And this backtracking technique enables uh, enable us to think about implementing uh, RRT sort of in physical space rather than based on an a priori map that's just in memory. And eventually, uh, this is actually a fairly myopic robot. The, the stereo uh, terrain assessment algorithm wasn't working all that well at that time. Most of the times that it stops and can't drive forward, it's actually terminating these branches of this path uh, based on an inclinometer threshold. So it, the robot is rolling over, it's pitching or rolling too much. So it's effectively feeling its way through the environment. And eventually it tries enough different things that it gets to the goal. And then we can prune off all the mistakes that we made on the way to the goal and exactly backtrack along the, the one route that actually found its way to the goal. Uh, so we get this very, uh, very precise path repeating capability. And in fact, now we could just take the direct route that we've already found to the, to the goal. In fact, we could go to any place that we've been to previously on this network of paths. If you'd like, you can think of this as kind of like a, a poor man's version of SLAM in the sense that, yes, we're building a map, yes, we're localizing against it, but we're not attempting to do any loop closure whatsoever, and therefore it happens on the cheap. We've also been working a lot with geologists and trying to think about uh, how to do geological exploration using robotic tools. Uh, and of course, all the interesting geology doesn't occur on stuff that, that looks like this. The interesting geology occurs on things that look like this. So we've been trying to build this uh, small tethered robot that will descend down a maybe not quite vertical rock face, something like a crater wall, build up a 3D model of that environment so that the, the geologists can have some situational awareness and decide whether they want to actually explore into that area. Uh, so what you're seeing is a, a tethered robot. There's a climbing rope here that isn't quite visible in the, in the video. Uh, and in fact, we've got this autonomous navigation operating on the robot right now. Of course, this isn't a real rock face. It's just a, a surrogate for initial testing. Uh, but what you're seeing is manually driving on the way down. And when, it's, when the robot's coming back up, it's actually using this visual navigation technique that, we descri that I described uh, previously. Uh, on the left, you can see sort of matched uh, feature tracks and, and VO tracks. Uh, this is the map that the robot has been creating as it's been driving up and down on the, on the surface. And so you can see it's actually very well localized. It know, knows where it is exactly with respect to this relative map, although we may not know where it is in the physical world. We also think that this, uh, this network of pads idea works reasonably well. It couples nicely with this, this tethered robot idea because for two reasons. Uh, this is a fairly three-dimensional surface, and so this idea of not having to have the map make sense in a global reference frame pairs nicely with that. 
And also, because of the tether, whenever you want to backtrack and go back up, you essentially do need to backtrack along the way that you came on the outbound pass. And so being able to navigate back along your tracks exactly pairs nicely with a tether. That was a sort of version one that you saw on the last slide. This is version two that, that we're working on now uh, that we call T-Rex, or Tethered Robot Explorer. Uh, we only have the mechanical bit working, so this is just, uh, just joysticked, but it's kind of uh, just demonstrating that we have the, the mechanics working and it's trying to do some tension control on the tether. Uh, so eventually we're going to take it from this configuration to this configuration. And the goal is to actually try to go up to Victoria Crater in the, the high Arctic in Canada next summer uh, to try and deploy down this rock face and build a, a three-dimensional model of that for, for geologists. Oh, by the way, we're going to put a, a LiDAR on top of this and use the fact that this spool is already actuated to get sort of free actuation to, to spin our LiDAR. So that's kind of the first half of the talk. We've deployed this, this route following technique on quite a number of robots now and, and driven so probably something like 500 kilometers in our, in our official testing on all these different platforms. We think it's a really uh, robust technique for driving outside, or at least it has the potential to be. And I, I kind of want to spend the second half of the talk pointing out some of the problems that some of you have probably already thought about as you've been watching me talk, uh, and, and sort of what we've been doing to address these. We've been to quite a few places, by the way, when we're, when we're testing this stuff. Uh, just this past summer, uh, I think we now hold the record maybe for the northernmost tested algorithm. Uh, if you're disoriented, CMU is down here somewhere. And the North Pole is about like right there, or something like that. Uh, so the place we're going next summer, hopefully, is, is this island over here. So pros and cons. Where are we today? I would say that this visual route following technique, uh, it provides a really low computational cost. It's basically just twice the cost of VO uh, technique for point-to-point -point navigation. Uh, in, particularly in GPS denied environments. I think it's really nice also because it exploits human experience. That's something we, we tend to not try to take advantage of all the time in robotics. The fact that the robot, you know, terrain assessment is a hard problem. If we can exploit the fact that a, a human can tell the robot where to go, I think that has a lot of merits. And then finally, a really big, a really good uh, pro for this technique is that it plays to the strengths of computer vision. Because we're literally trying to drive through the same viewpoints that we've been before, this is when computer vision actually <coughs> performs at its best, right? Changes in scale, viewpoint, and illumination are, are the types of things that break feature detectors and all of this stuff. And so if we can sidestep that by, by trying to use the same viewpoints, why not do that? On the con side, though, of course, you know, and, and I should say all of these cons are not necessarily specific to this technique. When we're driving outside, if you're using vision, appearance can change. The scene geometry, of course, can change over time. Vegetation can grow. Things can get built. Uh, this Gates building was not here the last time I was at CMU. Uh, the vehicle itself could be poorly modeled, which leads to bad path tracking, which gets into a vicious cycle that makes the vision system get worse and so on. And of course, the obvious thing, which is that if you're, if you're constrained to operating on specific pads, then those pads might get uh, obstructed, and then what do you do? You need to take detours around those. And now, maybe we should have just done you know, fully autonomous navigation to begin with. So that's my devil's advocate. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that we've been trying to address. Lighting is a big one. So even in our early days of testing this visual navigation technique, uh, we found that lighting was a big problem. We could teach these routes. I should say that we're using, uh, in, our, in our earlier work, we were using surf features to build up these relative maps, so triangulated surf features. Uh, we found that we could teach a route in the high Arctic, and about four hours later, that route was unusable. The robot could not match the current surf features that it was getting from its camera to the ones that we'd stored in the map. Uh, and of course, in the Arctic, the sun is low on the horizon, and, and you get a lot of, uh, you get a lot of very long shadows that move very, very quickly. And so this caused uh, feature detection to break. This is just a plot of a uh, number of feature matches over time. So we, we just took one image at this time here, and then we took all the images at these later times and tried to match them back to that first image and just counted the number of features that we matched. So the camera's not even moving. And you can see, you know, as the clouds come and go, the number of features change slightly, and things go well for a while, but then eventually the number of features that we're able to match drops away to nothing because the scene just doesn't look the same. And here's an example uh, of two places that are actually the same. 
but they look reasonably different. You'd be hard pressed as a human to find uh, things that match there easily. But if you come back the next day so that these are roughly the same time of day, things match nicely. So lighting is a problem. So the obvious thing to do with lighting is change sensors, right? Why not just use LiDAR? And we actually did this a couple of years ago now. Uh, we use LiDAR, but we use it in a different way than, than you would probably tend to think about LiDAR. So we usually think about point clouds when you think about LiDAR. Uh, we happen to have access to uh, a couple of LiDARs that produced really good intensity imagery. So if you think about this, this is kind of like a really expensive connect. We're getting both appearance information and depth information at every pixel from this LiDAR. Uh, so these are intensity images that came from, from these LiDARs, actually this one. Uh, and you can see just by extracting surf features for a LiDAR that's sitting still, the surf features over a 24-hour cycle in this LiDAR intensity imagery are really stable. They pretty much stay exactly the same. So it's kind of like a lighting invariant camera. Whereas, of course, in the passive camera, as it becomes night, things break. Uh, so we started working with this LiDAR, which was made by a small company in Canada, and it produced pretty reasonable quality intensity imagery, kind of like a low-res webcam at about two frames per second. Uh, and you're, you're actually seeing sort of a, a version of that here. The nice thing about using the LiDAR data in this way was that we didn't actually have to change much in our visual repeat pipeline. We only needed to change this bit at the, at the front end where we were using the imagery. So it's exactly the same as what we had before, but instead what we do is we just extract surf features from a single LiDAR intensity image uh, and then form these augmented key points, which basically means we add depth in from the fact that we're using LiDAR. And that gives us triangulated 3D features. And the rest of the pipeline stays the same. We still track features over time by matching to the previous frame and by matching to the map. And it turns out that this is actually good enough to basically solve the lighting problem, in my opinion. Uh, this is an example of an experiment we did uh, where we taught a route in broad daylight, sort of 12 o'clock noon on a super sunny day, and now you're seeing the robot repeating that route uh, just before sunrise. And I'm only showing you the one before sunrise because the one that we did in the middle of the night is just a big black square here, so you can't actually see the robot doing anything. But we actually matched every lighting condition possible back to that route that was taught at broad daylight. The robot had no trouble recognizing where it was by comparing images taken in under these different lighting conditions. Uh, you're seeing here the lighter intensity imagery, you're seeing uh, the features that are being matched to the map, and you're seeing the, the features that are being tracked with VO, and you're, you can see that we're getting many, many tens of features in both of those different pipelines. If either of them fails individually, that's okay because we rely on the other one, but if they both fail, we're in trouble. So that actually worked really well. I don't want to spend too much time talking about that. The problem is the sensor is really expensive. It's sort of a over a hundred thousand dollar sensor and that's not going to work for every application. So we started thinking about what could we do uh, to improve our pipeline that was based on passive cameras and fortuitously uh, Peter Cork and, and colleagues at Oxford uh, started looking at this idea of of using a passive camera, an RGB camera, and recognizing the fact that it's actually a multi-spectral camera. Right? So the red, the green, and the blue channels in an RGB camera image at different wavelengths and it turns out that there's a whole bunch of theory uh, from, uh, from photography where you can actually take those three different channels and map them into a, a lower dimensional color space that removes the effect of lighting to a certain degree. And this is really powerful. Uh, it turns out that you can construct these so-called color constant images uh, that essentially remove the effect of lighting, and they, they're a better representation of the actual material property that you're looking at. Uh, and the way that's done is you kind of, you have to assume something about your irradiator, so you assume you've got the sun, it's a black body irradiator, you make certain assumptions about, you know, the, the response of the channels being infinitely narrow, and do a bunch of crazy math, cancel out a bunch of terms, and you end up with this uh, we have to use Planck's law in there somewhere, and you end up with this image where every pixel is now sort of a, a weighted uh, log sum of the red, green, and blue channels. And you just do that on a per pixel basis. And that's how you construct these color constant images. And what the video up here is showing is regular grayscale stereo pair, and then two different color constant images that we were able to construct from a, a, a point gray Bumblebee XB3 stereo camera. And you can see that this is over time now, you can see uh, as the shadows are changing in the regular image, 
all the surf features between these two images drop away, but in fact, in these color constant images, we're able to keep quite a few features uh, matched, despite the fact that the lighting has changed. Uh, we came up with two different versions of these, one that performed well in sand and rocks, and another one that performed well in vegetation. Uh, and you can see here again, in the regular images, the, the surf features drop away, and in the color constant images, they, they remain reasonably constant. So this is a big boon for us because now we can teach a route and, and actually over a significant change in lighting still be able to match features. Uh, our pipeline changes only in a very, very simple way, which is that it stays exactly the same, the repeat pipeline, but we now extract features from uh, the regular grayscale images and each of these two different types of color constant images and we just mash them all together and try to match against all of those all the time. Really simple trick. And so, Here's an example now of repeating a route in a, in a rocks and sand type environment. And you can see that the red features, which are one of these sets of features that come from the color constant images, are kind of the only features or the, the biggest share of the features that we're able to match. And I should point out that the elapsed time between teach and repeat in this case is about seven hours. Uh, this would have made the regular grayscale images break for sure in this environment. We would not still be driving. And again, here in a, in a more vegetated environment, you can see, you know, look at all these shadows that, are, that were here in the, in the taut route but aren't in the, the repeat route. Uh, we're able to do a good job, and you can see it's these green features that are kind of dominating the, the matches that we're getting out of this pair. And again, that's about seven hours after we taught the route. Uh, we actually drove 27 kilometers and tried to match from sunrise to sunset uh, to a route that was taught at midday. And we, after 27 kilometers of driving, I think we had five manual interventions that were less than a meter long each. Uh, and if you'd compared that to not using these color constant images, we just wouldn't have worked at all. So this is a really simple trick that got us a long way towards uh, more robust performance in under lighting change. Uh, here's just another example of four different repeats at four different times of the day uh, where the robot uh, you know, is experiencing quite different lighting conditions. This one is, is actually uh, really late, just uh, past sunset almost. And you can see uh, they're all matching to the same route that was taught at midday. And, and I think this really shows that this is a really, uh, a really powerful yet simple trick that we can use to improve performance uh, outside. You can see sort of subtly the, the light is flatter over here. There's more uh, sharp shadows from the, the piles of sand in this route. And again, four different times a day. So that's just using an off-the-shelf camera and a really simple trick. A another question we might ask ourselves is, could we do even better by designing our own camera? So could we actually build a multispectral camera that, would, that would perform better by choosing the wavelengths that we want to use uh, uh, very carefully? And we don't know the answer to that yet, but we're working on that. Uh, we borrowed this sort of eight-channel multispectral camera from uh, from Arizona State, and we're trying to look at all the different combinations of, of different images at different wavelengths to see if we can come up with something that's even more robust under lighting change. But I don't know the answer yet. Okay, so different topic. So that's trying to deal with lighting. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is this idea of not having modeled your vehicle correctly. So remember, Teach and Repeat is sort of this path localizer module, but also a path tracking module. So now we're going to talk about the path tracking part. And you know, the problem with path tracking is, in this particular technique, if we get out of the path, this can be a problem. Uh, it can be a problem for a few reasons. The first is there could be an obstacle there, and the human may have taught the robot very deliberately to go near the obstacle, but if it goes out of the tracks, it'll hit it. The other thing is it makes the, the vision system worse, right? So if you're not doing a good job tracking the path, you now have a change in viewpoint, and that'll actually make the localization worse. So we really want to track paths as accurately as possible in this technique. And there's actually a few problems with that. Um, one of the biggest problems is, in fact, that we don't have a very good model of the robot. Uh, typically, when we design these controllers, we start with some really simple kinematic model of the robot, like a unicycle on flat ground. And in reality, this is a robot that's outside. It's driving around on rough terrain. There could be significant dynamics. And so as soon as those things start to come into play, those are effectively disturbances uh, on, on the, the system that, that cause it to get out of the tracks. Uh, so we've been looking at borrowing some ideas from my colleague, uh, Angela Scholig, uh, who used to, used to do uh, the same kind of stuff uh, on quad rotors at ETH, uh, who's now in my department. And 
And she uses this idea of, of this sort of hybrid scheme where you start with a really simple model of, of your vehicle or, or any simple model, design a controller that stabilizes the route but stabilizes the performance but doesn't have necessarily really good performance. Uh, and then what you do is you gather experience. So we have a really special situation in this route following technique in that we're driving the route but then repeating it perhaps several times. So we, we can actually learn from that experience if we save it. If we save the path tracking errors each time we repeat the route, we can use that to try and improve our controller at the next trial. Uh, and the first idea that we used was an old idea from robotics that's been used in manipulators and factories for a long time called iterative learning control, uh, where we basically save uh, all of the errors with respect to the path from previous repeats, and then we use that to try and build up a feed-forward correction to our control that will allow the robot to stay in the tracks better. So you can think of it this way intuitively. If the robot always goes wide when it's going around a corner, what should you do the next time? Steer earlier, right? It's really that simple. And so this feed-forward correction basically learns that ability to steer early to stay in the tracks and essentially spread out the error. And it just does that automatically from gathering experience from previous repeats. Here's a video of that happening. So this is just the top pass. We're showing the robot in this video where it should drive. And you'll note it's about this far away from this pile of rocks. And now we're going to try and drive that route at one meter per second autonomously using our, our simple controller. And you can see the robot goes wide and it crashes into a pile of rocks. And luckily, we didn't break the robot. So now you're looking at this learning technique that first actually starts driving slowly. It did have a path tracking error here. But the vision system can measure that, and so that's now an experience. Check, we've got an experience. We improve the controller, but we also try to drive a little bit faster at the same time. And you can see that after just three or four iterations, we're actually able to drive quite accurately in the tracks at the, at the desired speed of one meter per second. And we did that by letting the robot essentially make mistakes, but in a controlled environment. We let it have small path tracking errors and gradually brought the speed up on a schedule. Uh, and, and so I should mention that at this top speed, I wasn't able to find any grad students in my lab that were able to drive the path as accurately as this controller. So it, it really was telling for me that this technique was working. Here's just a, another example of a, of a bigger robot, and I'll note there's no speed up on this video, and the robot's trying to drive uh, quite quickly along this path. Uh, and this is now a new version of the algorithm that, that doesn't use this feed forward correction, but actually uses a, a Gaussian process model of the disturbance uh, that, it, that it gleans from these experiences in driving the route previously. And then that GP model is used within a nonlinear model predictive control framework to try and uh, figure out how to, to keep the vehicle on the path. So we're learning this part of the model that we don't know about in advance over time, and then using that within our, our control design. And we're actually even building in the idea of robustness from, uh, from robust control theory here by, by using the uncertainty that comes along with this GP model uh, in this, in this uh, nonlinear model predictive control step. So we're, we're looking at sort of a min-max criterion where we look at the worst case that could happen if the uncertainty all went in the same direction at the same time and then trying to find the best controller uh, under that maximum error. And I didn't talk to the video very well, but hopefully you saw after an iteration or two, the robot, uh, there was a pylon at the end that it was hitting on the first iteration, and at the end it, it wasn't, and, and we're able to drive quite quickly. I should also mention that we have this, uh, this other paper here uh, for a technique that we call Speed Demon that actually takes care of the speed scheduling as well. And it does that in kind of a clever way. Um, it not only looks at properties of the path, like the curvature in different directions and slows down for bumps and turns, but it also looks at path tracking error, it looks at quality of the output of the vision system and schedules the speed uh, carefully based on all of these different criteria. And coupling that with the learning is really interesting because uh, as the system gets better at tracking the path at a given speed, the speed demon speed schedule will, will now say, ah, you're doing a good job at that part of the path now, let's try and go a little bit faster there the next time. And then it goes faster and if the error gets too big then it stops increasing the speed. So the system learns to drive fast where it can while keeping the path tracking errors small. Another topic. So obstructions are a problem. And I should say I'm starting to get into the area that's future work. And I've been talking for about 37 minutes. So I'm, I'm right on schedule. Um, uh, obstructions. So I don't know if Sid is here. Is Sid here? OK, Sid's not here. Um, 
Obstructions are a problem. And, and in the technique that we've been building up so far, uh, we can get around some obstructions, right? So I showed you this, this example before where the robot is driving and if there's an obstruction, it can sort of backtrack along its route and branch around. What happens if there's actually an obstruction when it's coming back, for example, on this main part of the path, this trunk? It doesn't have an alternative now. Uh, and in fact, in the technique that we built up so far, the map that we build is always a tree. And it's because I take this rather sort of uh, controversial stance that loop closure really just isn't necessary for a lot of these autonomous goal-seeking problems. Um, and, and some people will probably pound their fists on the table and say we must have loop closure, but up to this point, everything I've done really hasn't needed loop closure. Uh, but unfortunately, when I start talking about driving around on paths and repairing them, if something happens to the map uh, in the long term, I, I very begrudgingly admit that we may need to think about loop closure at this point. And, and so it has to do with the idea of if something blocks the path here and you're here and you want to get to there, I don't want to have to <coughs> sort of chop off the tree and throw away everything above there. What I'd really like to do is repair the path. And the obvious way to do that is to start thinking about uh, using a planner to exit the known part of the world, go into the unknown and add some new branches. And, and so what this means is that you need to deliberately think about exiting and re-coming back into the paths over here and get back into your tracks. So you're, it's a little bit different than the loop closure in the sense of place recognition. Place recognition, the robot is effectively wandering around in the world almost completely at random and opportunistically it says, ah, I've been here before. That's not what I'm talking about here. What I'm talking about is deliberately and methodically trying to plan for a loop closure. And so, you know, as a cartoon, it looks something kind of like this. We teach the root, and we, we can use that to repeat, and eventually something may come along and maybe something happens and we can't recognize where we are. Or maybe someone parks their car on the route and that part of the route is no longer usable. So we don't want to have to sacrifice everything we know. We'd like to repair it. And so you can think about how do we, how do we repair this? How do we get back from one place to another? Uh, the robot only really knows about this part of the world that's shaded in in this technique. And so we could think about applying some kind of a planner that, that tries to relearn a new part of this, this route. And it might do this, it might try to exit, it might find there's another obstruction, it could try something else, and eventually it might close this loop. So there's your loop closure. Uh, but of course, under what criterion should we do that? There are many paths that will close that loop. Um, should we minimize distance? Maybe. Uh, I would argue that the thing we want to do, because we're trying to literally rendezvous with our own tracks, is some kind of uncertainty-based criterion. And so you could think about the fact that you know, uncertainty grows with distance in a lot of these techniques. And so different paths, when we rendezvous with our tracks, will have different confidence. So we kind of want to pick the path that will have the most likely outcome of us being in our tracks on the other side of the obstruction. And eventually the robot may pick this path and the other place we might need loop closure is, is taking shortcuts. So in the, in the technique I've showed you so far, we can actually teach paths where the robot's path crosses itself an arbitrary number of times. And if we want to come back to the start, what we have to do is backtrack through all of that, which could be really wasteful, right? So the other place the loop closure I think is useful is finding shortcuts. And so again, this could be based on some kind of an uncertainty criterion that looks at different options uh, and going this way could be pretty expensive compared to, say, going this way, which results in a smaller uncertainty when you want to get to that goal. So we're thinking about these loop closure problems. And I have a student working on this. He's been working on it for a while. And unfortunately, he got sidetracked. Um, and I partly blame Sid, because he's not here. Uh, so we started trying to apply these motion planning techniques to, uh, to this path repair problem. Uh, and unfortunately, my student just ended up being sucked into the world of motion planning and ended up coming up with a couple of new uh, motion planning algorithms. Uh, I'm not going to talk about them too much, but I thought I'd take this chance to, to advertise them. This is work we're doing with SID. Uh, the two algorithms are informed RT star and bit star. Uh, OMPL implementations are imminent if you're interested in checking them out. But basically, they, they purport to try and speed up uh, the idea of sample-based motion planning. And they do that by essentially bringing heuristics back in. So, Everyone knows A star, raise your hand if you know A star, right? Everyone knows A star. A star uses heuristics to make planning faster. We don't have to expand all parts of the graph. And so these algorithms try to, to use this idea. If you know LPA star, effectively this is uh, LPA star on random geometric graphs. And, and effectively you can use heuristics to limit where you sample, but you can also use heuristics to 
choose an order in which to process samples. So you can throw samples down as a batch and then order those based on some heuristic knowledge about, on a, about, how, fa, about how long the path should be. And, and actually, you can speed up the planning immensely. Uh, I won't get into the details, but I'll show you the video just to try and convince you. These are sort of four, four modern optimal sample-based motion planners, our T-star, FMT-star, and then our two new algorithms. Uh, and they're trying to plan from a goal to a, sorry, a start to a goal. And, and this one, you can see uh, BitStar really just hasn't explored much of the world here because it's used the heuristic to guide its search uh, in, a, in a really, I think, useful way. The other thing I should mention is what are we giving up in these planners? Uh, these two planners actually are planning an optimal path from the start to every point in the space, which I think is, is interesting but potentially not necessary, whereas these planners are really just focused on finding the one optimal path from the start to the one goal that we care about. So that's what you're kind of giving up. Uh, we've actually tried this on Herb uh, upstairs. Uh, this, is a, this is a plan that BitStar found after four seconds, which is fairly reminiscent after, so I should say this is a 14-dimensional space, and the other planners that we tried didn't find any solutions after 10 minutes. Uh, and, and so this is the solution that BitStar found after two and a half minutes. And it, you know, it at least looks somewhat reasonable. So we're hoping that, at least in high dimensions, this, this may be a route forward for sample-based motion planning. Uh, I think I'm actually going to skip this last topic. I'm really interested in trying to look at long-term lo localization and mapping, trying to build up maps that will last for potentially 10 years. And I think outdoors, that's a really challenging thing to do. I don't know the answer on how to do that. Um, it goes way beyond just dealing with lighting change and small changes to the vehicle. Uh, so if you have any ideas, I've talked to many of you about this uh, uh, throughout the day, and I think it's a really interesting and, and tough topic. I'm just going to skip this last bit and just show you my, my last video. Um, I'm probably going to stop there and take some questions while this video plays. This is just our root following technique, uh, doing an autonomous repeat in a vegetated environment uh, outside of my lab. And uh, there's a really good soundtrack if you want to look online. Uh, there's, a, there's a good soundtrack to this video that, that's really entertaining. So uh, I think I'll stop there and take your questions. about the illumination uh, in bearing uh, uh, part. So I'm a bit surprised that, that using this technique for the intrinsic images help, since supposedly the usual descriptors like Sir, they all... Sorry, just, just to be clear, are we talking about the lighter intensity images or the RGB? The intrinsic images from like, normal cameras. Illumination. Yep, passive cameras. Uh, yeah, so most descriptors like surf, like the invariant supposedly to at least some degree of illumination changes. So I'm a bit surprised no, that... That's, that why it, that's why it worked at all before, right? So why did you have any insight as to why doing this additional preprocessing step up? Yeah, so actually we did a, a little, I didn't get into the details, but we did a little bit of a study of what exactly is breaking in surf as lighting changes. And in fact, it's both the detector and the descriptor that, that break. The detector, especially when you start to get long shadows appearing, instead of detecting one feature, it can actually split into, into two. Uh, so that, that's one problem. And then on the descriptor side, uh, in whatever space that you're doing the matching, this Euclidean space from the, the feature descriptor vector, it just gets too far away as the lighting changes. So it, it, it really kind of breaks both halves of it. Whereas the, using the thing that effectively tries to eliminate shadows at least helps a little bit. It doesn't get you all the way there. You can still see it's not as many features as, as sort of taking an image and then matching to it a second later, but it, it's a lot better than nothing. Uh, since that video finished, I'm just going to flip to one more slide, which is just a uh, gratuitous advertisement that uh, field and service robotics uh, will be held in Toronto next summer, and it would be really great to see you all there. David and I are organizing, so please come and submit a paper. Yeah, so your um, the results for using cameras to follow these images in these kinds of world is actually uh, remarkable. And uh, the, I was trying to figure out why, why I was surprised. And here's my surprise. Maybe you can think about giving the intuition as to why this is, shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, so it seems that Apart from lighting changes, but we can understand that we deliver that by color constancy. The 
if you work in three-dimensional worlds, you actually have occlusions and you have the world appears quite differently based on the kinds of vantage points you look at it. So what I'm very surprised by is that you can do a 2D match and come up with something that can uh, that is so accurate in terms of finding your opposite, your sort of lateral error, that you can actually then thread these narrow kinds of things. So if, so if it was a flat world, uh, so I should say that I should say the pose localization is happening in 3D and then being projected down to 2D to create the path errors. If that helps. The other thing is though we're controlling the vantage point, right? We're literally trying to drive the robot through the same viewpoints from the teach pass to the repeat pass. So so in a sense we're as I said playing to the strengths of computer vision because we're trying to see the features from the same angles that we saw them before. But the point is, if you ever get off, then you get further off, and the more you get off, the further off. So the question yep. here is, why doesn't this diverge more often, given the yep. diversity of, yeah. the, of the terrain that you're in? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. So we've done studies about, so basically the, the closed loop performance has to be good enough that the vision system doesn't break. And it just turns out that we've come up with a system where that's true. The path tracking errors, under nominal performance are so much smaller than the stability envelope for the vision system that, that it works. If it was the other way around, it would break, right? The path tracking error could get big and then the vision system can't recognize where it is and then it's, it'll never recover. Um, the other thing is we have lots of layers in there, right, that are, that are dealing with robustness. There's RANSAC at, at the lowest level. Then there's the fact that we're running visual odometry and map matching, and so we don't have to match to the map all the time. We can actually go 20 meters with a stereo camera without matching to the map and still get back into our track sometimes. Um, then there's the color constancy stuff. And then if we really do get lost and we don't know where we are, the vehicle actually stops and then runs a place recognition algorithm and searches up and down the entire route to try and figure out where it is. And if it figures it out, then it'll, it'll start again. So there's you know four or five layers of robustness that add up to a working system. I'd I'd say. Yeah. So you store um, systematic errors. Next time around, feed through, uh, feed forward. Don't make that mistake again. Yep. But the errors are not kind enough to tell you whether they're systematic or random. That's right. And if what you stored was a random error, then the next time through. You yep. Can That's stay. right. That's exactly right. Yep. So. So in iterative learning control, they get around that by not completely trusting the error right away. So there's a proportional controller in there at the full trajectory level that nudges, it nudges the, the answer towards what the errors are saying. Mm -hmm. And it does it slowly enough that there's an averaging effect over multiple trials that you get the systematic part, but you reject the, the noisy part. But that's a good question. In the part where you're know, learning the caution processes for the feed forward controller, where the caution processes uh, learned on a per uh, location or per node basis or where they for the entire track? Yeah, so the question is what, what are the input variables of the, of the GP in this learning model? Uh, in the video that I showed you, the GP, one of the inputs is the, the distance along the path. Um, this is actually what makes the technique work. We're effectively learning the disturbance at every point along the path. And so we don't even need to know the nature of the disturbance. We're not trying to generalize. Much of the theme of my research is don't generalize. <laughs> um, we're just trying to come up with a, a disturbance model along the path and then use that in the control design. Generalizing is harder. So your, your system is robust to elimination changes, but what about uh, that very last video that you were showing? When you're trying in winter? Yeah, that's a great question. When you don't have, it's completely changed. Yep, environment. we're not there yet. We're not there yet. So as I said, Many things can change. Uh, we're at the point where we can, I think we can teach a route and it'll be good enough in these highly vegetated environments maybe for a week. Uh, but as soon as the weather changes significantly or the leaves all fall off the trees and the snow comes or someone puts up a gates building next to our route, it, uh, it's going to break. So that's where I want to go for the next 10 years. I don't know who was first. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That's a good question. So, so now we're talking about keeping around history, or maybe, you know, replacing what we've seen on the route with the latest version. Um, my answer to that is, I feel like that's a little bit like taking a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. My goal here is to literally drive 
in the same physical place. And so you could potentially think about updating just the descriptors, but you definitely don't want to move the features from where you saw them before, because that's eventually going to allow the path to wiggle away from its physical rooting in the environment. Um, that's one strategy. People have done that for long-term mapping. I think that's maybe the first thing to try. Somehow just map, simple map updating. What I really want to do is try to keep all the data around, keep the whole history around, and try and mine that history for the part that's useful to localize. Um, for me, as I move forward, I, I, I skipped these last couple of slides, but my mantra moving forward is that mapping equals logging. So don't do anything. Don't bake in any choices in your map when you're, when you're building it. Just log the data and then make all your choices at use time. So that's, that's kind of where I want to go. There was another question over there. No, you're good. All right. At the back there. Um, if you're going to be teaching a robot how to run along, uh, how long does I will see uh, what can actually have changes in mass different from the actually loading the truck? Oh, so changes in like when the when the bucket is loaded or not loaded? Is loaded say, for example, you're not dying the dynamic stuff. Yeah. Uh, so so I should say that was 10 years ago. I haven't worked on that problem since. But at that time, we actually had to deal with that because 10 tons of rock can change the dynamics of your vehicle a little bit. Uh, we just designed two controllers. Mm -hmm. The bucket, bucket was either full or empty. It wasn't anywhere in between. So, Yeah. Uh, Sorry, I didn't hear the question. What filters am I using what in the image? Features. features. Oh, we're, in all of the videos you saw, we're using Surf. Um, mainly because we did a GPU implementation of it that got pulled into OpenCV a few years ago. Um, so we, we kind of like it, and it's got heritage for us. But there are lots of other options out there now. Uh, the Oxford group, I think, is using Brief now. And they, they like it for this type of stuff. Anything else? Yeah. What about, uh, have you looked at active illumination, like flash and uh, camera? And uh, I would say yes, because I've used LiDAR. Um, right, right. But, but I know what you mean. Have I tried putting uh, floodlights on the, on the yeah, vehicle or something? Yeah, if you're flashing. I mean, it's the same as LiDAR, but it would be potentially lower cost. To do, right? Yeah, potentially. Um, I would say that's, that's going to work for driving in the dark, but I'm not sure that would solve the problem of matching full sunlight to full darkness. I think. A sunlit scene well, you could and, a, and a dark scene with, yeah, but the illumination is going to be significantly different from the sun and from a light that's on the robot. No, so, but if you flash the image, right? You it's can, like a fill flash right? like just, for what photographers are used to. Yeah, so try and over, so yeah, I, we actually haven't tried that. We tried simple headlights and, and didn't have a lot of success with that, but right, well, you it's possible. Flash it so that you just see the flash image and we take out the sun. Yeah, it's a good idea. We should probably try that. It's not very pleasant to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get migraines from strobe lights, so I, don't, I really don't want to go there. But Maniola. So there's an assumption that the digital image is going to be able to, there's, there's a need to wait the path of the example, on the field of the board or on the desert. Yeah. I think it's going to look about the same, right? Sure. So you use a lot of GPS to communicate with anything or you are faithful just So So our exp Right now, we're faithful that it works. And, and the reason I would say it works is it works on grass. You can take a mown grass lawn, point the camera at only the grass, and there's enough there for, for low-level features to actually do VO and do tracking. It's a really hard environment for VO, but it, it actually does work. Uh, so we do a lot of our testing in desert-like environments. And you'd be surprised at how non-monotone desert-like environments are. There's always sand drifts and small rocks and pebbles. Haven't had a problem in, in sandy environments at all. Actually, I prefer sandy environments because it makes control easier, but for, in, some, in some respects. Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much.